Okay. So today we're very happy to have Bauer and Kometsano to so tell us about generalized eigenstate thermalization, JT with mapper, and random matrices. Take it away. Uh, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's a pleasure to do it virtually. Uh, so I will speak about this work uh, posted a couple of months ago with Daniel Jeffers, David Kolchmeyer, and Glenn Sonner on uh, ETH and uh, JT gravity. So uh, the outline is that uh, first we will uh, briefly review the uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and give uh, a motivation for it. Uh, then we will uh, give uh, sort of uh, frame it in the context of uh, multi-matrix models. Uh, so this is more or less general story, uh, I believe. Uh, and uh, in the second part, we will focus on a particular uh, example, uh, which will be JT gravity coupled to a free uh, massive scalar. Uh, so we will discuss uh, the uh, correlation functions on the disks of the disk and on higher topologies. Uh, and in particular, in, in particular, we will just give a general uh, prescription uh, using uh, the so-called core diagrams for how to compute such correlators on uh, an arbitrary Riemann surface. And finally, in the third part, we will discuss the matrix model, uh, which is uh, which reproduces the same correlation functions and uh, various subtleties related to that matrix models. Okay, so we start with the ETH. So I'm sure most of you guys know this, uh, or 90% of you know this very well, but let me make sure we're still on the same page. So uh, uh, let's take some uh, chaotic quantum mechanical system, uh, and we take some initial state psi, uh with some average energy e uh, and we have some distribution of energies which is narrowly peaked around that energy let's say and then we do time evolution uh, and after some time t uh, we uh, take some simple few body observable uh, operator o and we are interested in computing its expectation value at that time t uh, so, of course, uh, we can expand uh, this expectation value in the uh, energy eigenstates in this way. Uh, however, uh, physically, uh, what we expect is that uh, after uh, some thermalization time, uh, observables take a universal, universal uh, thermal expectation value. So in this case, uh, let's say uh, an expectation value in a microcanonical ensemble with energy E. And so the question is, how uh, do we get this universal uh, answer from, uh, uh, from an arbitrary initial state? And so, of course, the way it happens is that uh, there is a, uh, uh, a off-diagonal term, which uh, uh, is oscillating and decays. Uh, with time. And so uh, the uh, thermal answer is supposed to be reproduced by this uh, first diagonal term. Uh, however, uh, there seems to be two puzzling features about this uh, uh, process. So uh, the first uh, puzzling feature is that uh, naively, this first term seems to depend uh, very much on the initial state through these coefficients Cn. So how come we know that microcanonical answer is universal? And the second puzzling feature is that uh, in this uh, second term, uh, we uh, uh, so it uh, it is small because of oscillations, but then naively you might expect that really this term decays only on time scales of order the inverse energy spacing, which is of course not true in uh, real life when where thermalization time is much small, smaller than, than that, of course. And so uh, both of these puzzles uh, are resolved by eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And this is an ansatz for, uh, uh, for the matrix elements uh, of an operator O in the energy eigenstates. So we have a diagonal term, which is proportional to the thermal expectation value. 
and we have an off diagonal term uh, of diagonal terms which are exponentially small in the entropy and are proportional to uh, some numbers R and M which are, happen to be pseudo random numbers. For example, you can take them to be uh, uh, from a Gaussian uh, ensemble. And then if we take the ansatz, so first of all, let's see what happens if we insert it back. So uh, in the first term, the important piece is the, this diagonal term. And so then you see that uh, because this is identity, then the only thing that survives is the normalization constant, which is one. Uh, and then we just get the uh, thermal expectation value. Uh, so that's why uh, the answer does not depend on the uh, initial state very much is because of this universal form of the matrix elements. And the second puzzle uh, is resolved because now uh, individual uh, of the angle terms are exponentially small. So because of that, you don't actually need to wait uh, exponentially long time, but you need to wait only on some order one time in the entropy. Okay, so this was a sort of old story. I'm sure, uh, uh, sure you know this pretty well. Uh, so uh, ETH is essentially states that O and M is a random matrix. So in particular, uh, these powers of e to the uh, minus s here uh, are such that uh, the uh, thermal two-point correlator uh, is of order one, as we uh, ex physically expect. Um, so this is uh, done easily by expanding into the uh, energy basis again, and then uh, some powers e to the minus s from the normalization, e to the 2s from two summations over the energies, and e to the minus s from this O from this O and M squared. Okay, so this is a more or less standard story. Uh, so, uh, so this matrix R and M uh, or O and M uh, is often assumed to be a Gaussian uh, random matrix. And this is indeed enough if you're interested only in two point correlators uh, or lower. Uh, however, uh, if you're interested in uh, higher uh, non trivial correlators, uh, then you need non Gaussianities in this matrix RNM, as was discussed by various people and, uh, before us. So, for example, if you want to uh, reproduce non-trivial OTOCs, uh, out of time correlate, uh, out of time order correlators, then you need some non-Gaussianities in this matrix RNA. Uh, and uh, such non-Gaussianities were previously considered. Uh, uh, so, for example, in the paper by Foyni and Kurchan. Uh, and they introduced uh, just higher moments, similar to this uh, moment, to, uh, second moment, they uh, considered higher moments uh, of this matrix elements. Uh, and in particular, uh, uh, they, they, they wrote this important uh, scalings with the entropy. And essentially, again, these scaling, scalings with the entropy are uh, such that uh, all thermal correlators uh, uh, are of order one in the entropy. So this is sort of a natural generalization of ETH. Uh, however, we can uh, go even further than that. So in a chaotic system, uh, the Hamiltonian itself uh, behaves as a random uh, matrix, as we know very well. Uh, and it is therefore natural to treat both the Hamiltonian and the op our simple few body operators all on the same footing. After all, there are just some operators on the Hilbert space. Uh, and therefore, uh, what we would like to propose is uh, uh, the following, uh, that uh, generalized uh, eigenstate thermalization, uh, you can think of uh, as follows, that in a chaotic quantum mechanical system, uh, the Hamiltonian and all few body uh, operators O are essentially random matrices uh, that should be drawn simultaneously from some random matrix ensemble. Uh, this is very essentially 
what people had been saying, maybe not exactly in this, in this language, it's just uh, 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 sort of re, uh, maybe reinterpreting uh, what has been discussed so far. So uh, in particular, all these scalings with the entropy uh, right, that, that people uh, have discussed, uh, they follow naturally just from the standard toothed counting at large M. So this is just uh, in high energy community, this is something extremely familiar. All of the scalings uh, with N, where N is of order E to the S, uh, N is the size of the uh, Hilbert space. Uh, the, the, these are all very standard from uh, toothed, uh, toothed counting. So for example, the two point function scales as one over N and that's E to the minus S. There is a question. Yes. Uh, so, uh, I mean, does this somehow take into account like the, the specific operators that are, that you're interested in might have some commutate specific commutation relations or or some some more detailed information. So is this somehow taking that into account, or or are, are we saying what what exactly are we saying about that? Right, right. So yeah, that's a that's a very interesting question, uh, and uh, so uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, the idea is that in a general chaotic system. Somehow, uh, of course, uh, 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 yeah, let's say, you know, like you take, uh, uh, yeah, there's some specific uh, commutation relation between operators, of course, uh, uh, and these are, let's say, two independent operators. Uh, then, uh, uh, of course, it will not be obeyed by just some randomly independently chosen matrices. So uh, the idea is that uh should then uh, the, the way it should work is that uh in the matrix model you do some scaling for example you take large n and only in this limit these co uh, correlators are imposed uh so in a general case for like you know generic you know chaotic spin chain we don't really have a specific concrete example we can discuss i think it might be interesting to think about that but in the holographic example, which I will discuss, actually something like that happens. So because in GFF, uh, in GFF, uh, there are some non-trivial correlation uh, uh, co uh, correlators, like O of zero with O of T is proportional to identity, uh, the correlator in, in, in GFF. And so we need to impose that somehow. And the way it's imposed is that uh, essentially uh, in the potential, there is a term like n times the correlator squared. And we will discuss this in more detail uh, later. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, so uh, great. Uh, oh, yeah, and uh, I should, uh, yeah, I should, uh, I guess, m make a comment here that uh, so here, uh, yes, uh, well, uh, I, I wrote a single trace potential. Uh, one thing I did here is I wrote the single trace potential. And uh, in uh, holographic systems, uh, this is uh, something uh, very natural because uh, it is related to bulk locality. Uh, this is sort of, if you think about the matrix H as, uh, 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 as uh, and you, uh, in the sense of matrix model dualities from the 80s where the two diagrams build the Riemann surface, let's say, uh, then from that perspective, a single traceness is related to bulk locality. So in that sense, the, the, in holographic systems, it's kind of natural. Uh, but in a generic chaotic uh, quantum system, I, uh, I do not know whether this is true. This is something to uh, maybe be understood in more detail. So this is just uh, one comment. Okay, so uh, this was my uh, sort of general uh, introduction. Uh, uh, so if there are questions about general introduction, it's a uh, good time to ask them. Uh, okay, so uh, now uh, to really make uh, some actual progress, uh, we will focus on a particular model, which will be just a JG gravity coupled to a free massive scalar. And uh, we will be interested in correlators of this type where we have many boundaries and we insert as many O's as you like. 
uh, and on various uh, topologies. And so we will first give a, a prescription for how to compute such correlators in JT gravity. And then we will move on to the to matrix model. Okay, so we discuss the JT gravity. So uh, now many of you maybe are rolling your eyes because you've seen this slide <laughs> like a hundred times now, but uh, let me st uh, still review this because uh, similar logic, uh, we will have a similar logic uh, in the two matrix model and uh, in uh, after we couple to, to, the, uh, to, to the free scalar. So this is uh, sort of important how this works. Uh, and so we consider JT gravity. Uh, so first review pure JT gravity. It's a theory of the Dilaton and the metric. So it has uh, this uh, action. Uh, so there's a term uh, which is uh, proportional to the Euler character of the uh, Riemann surface and some and some counting parameters not. So there's a term phi times r plus two. Uh, and the role of this term is that if you integrate out the dilaton, essentially you localize onto uh, hyperbolic uh, surfaces. And there's some boundary term. And so uh, the only degrees of freedom that survive in this uh, theory uh, are uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, boundary mode. So for example, on the disk, uh, let's say we have some embedding of actual space time into the disk and you integrate over the shapes of this uh, embedding. So this is the boundary mod. And there's also integral over uh, moduli uh, of, of the Riemann surface. And so uh, a few years ago, Saad, Schenker and Stanford uh, in fact showed that this uh, integral path integral in the H gravity uh, uh, can be computed exactly. And so if you uh, if your boundary conditions are such that you have n boundaries with lengths beta 1 through beta n, then this path integral uh, exactly computes a, a matrix integral uh, of the Hamiltonian uh, H with some specific potential V, which I'm not going to write explicitly. Uh, and uh, uh, the expectation value of the product of traces in this matrix model. Okay, so this is an exact uh, quality uh, as a perturbative series in one over n. Uh, and so, uh, for example, uh, if you if we compute just one partition function, then this decomposition is that we have a disk. We have then disk with a handle, with two handles, and so on. And so uh, the way uh, this is proved is essentially uh, in two steps. And these two steps uh, will be important because they will, uh, we, were, we will argue that they generalize to the two matrix model case. So first, uh, you compute uh, the uh, disk partition function in JT gravity which is known explicitly. It's given by this famous cinch density of states. And then in the matrix model, uh, uh, you also assume this density of states on the disk, and this, di and this disk density of states fixes the matrix potential. So it turns out that the disk density of states is equivalent to knowing the potential. And so this fixes the matrix model. Uh, and uh, so this is step number one. And the step number two uh, is that now you want to compute all the higher genus and more boundaries uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. And this is done through this so-called uh, topological recursion in the matrix model. So in the matrix model, uh, uh, as was uh, uh, understood in detail by Einart, uh, once you know the disk, density of states, there are certain recursion relations in uh, the genus and the number of boundaries that allow you to derive all the uh, higher genus and more boundaries contributions, uh, well, uh, uh, contributions to, uh, 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 to this object uh, from the disk. And then these recursion relations, uh, they mapped uh, to a similar uh, recursion uh, in the bulk. 
And so in this way, we show this, uh, the Saad, Schenker, and Sandberg show this duality. Okay, so this was uh, uh, the old story. Uh, now, uh, now we would like to couple this to, to, to a free massive scale. Uh, so we couple it to some uh, uh, to, uh, to this uh, scalar. Uh, it has some dimension delta, uh, and uh, it couples to to JT only through this boundary mode. And the correlation functions uh, of the uh, uh, dual operators uh, on the disk were computed by these people, and they uh, derived. Uh, a certain set of uh, uh, what you might call gravitational gravitational Feynman rules, uh, and the answer is the following. So, if you can compute this correlator, uh, what you should do, you should sum over all chord diagrams. So, what are these? Uh, so, what you do is you uh, you draw a circle, uh, you put your operators as many as you have. And then you draw all possible chord diagrams. That is, you connect these operators pairwise and you uh, sum all such chord diagrams. Now, for each chord diagram, uh, you uh, write a formula. And the formula uh, is written as follows. First, you assign energies to each uh, region between the chords here. And uh, then the rules of the game are that if you have uh, this blue line, which is uh, connecting to the boundary, then you write these gamma functions. So here plus minus just means that I uh, take a product of four gamma functions for all choices of the sign. And if you have an intersection uh, of chords, then you write this uh, uh, function, uh, which is the uh, so-called 6J symbol of sol 2 r So it's related to some representation theory. Doesn't matter too much. But that's the that, that's sort of the prescription. So so now let's uh, let's practice. Uh, so um, the two-point function. Uh, so we just have one chord diagram. We have uh, two of these three-point vertices. So we have two uh, factors uh, which combine just in one uh, in these gamma functions. Well, and then if you want to go to real Euclidean time, you also need to integrate with the standard uh, factors of uh, exponentials and densities of states and uh, so in, a, in, in a standard way. OK, so for the four-point function, you have three chord diagrams, which are essentially like weak contractions. And again, using those uh, uh, rules from the previous previous slide, the first two terms, they contain only these uh, gamma functions. So this is a shorthand for these gamma functions. And the third term has an intersection and contains this uh, 6J symbol. Okay, so far so good. Well, next we discuss wormholes. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, you guys know Nemo very well. This is his new license plate. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, next we discuss wormholes. Uh, so what happens on uh, higher topologies uh, or high, more boundaries in this case? Well, uh, one new ingredient uh, on the uh, double trumpet is that now uh, actually the one loop determinant is not trivial. So on the disk, it turns out the one loop determinant is trivial, but on the uh, it's just some renormalization of uh, like G Newton uh, and S not, but on the double trumpet, it's actually not trivial. And uh, to compute it, uh, actually, there's a nice uh, so-called Selberg trace formula that computes for you a determinant of Laplace operator on any hyperbolic surface. And the formula is that uh, you take a product over all uh, primitive geodesics, over all primitive closed geodesics on the Riemann surface. And for each geodesic, you have some uh, some factor, 
where B gamma is the length of this geodesic. So the sum over n, you can think of roughly as like the number of uh, windings. Uh, so, uh, right. And so uh, just to uh, understand this formula a little better, uh, let me actually, uh, let me uh, add a slide before and uh, uh, write it in a little more detail. So let's say for n equals one, uh, we just have a term here minus uh, delta times b, one minus e to the minus b, uh, which you can write as a sum over n uh, if you just expand this uh, denominator minus a delta plus m b. And uh, this uh, series you can uh, think of as uh, contributions from the operator O of dimension delta propagating on this closed geodesic and all of its descendants, including all of its descendants. So these are uh, delta plus m. So similarly, uh, for n equals two contribution in this formula, uh, you can expand it in a similar way and see that those you can think of as contribution of uh, double trace operators plus 2k, let's say. So uh, yeah. So n equals two contribution here is uh, basically uh, you can think of as double trace operators or states propagating on the closed geodesic. And so it's kind of, uh, uh, yeah, then, then this formula becomes a more, much more, much more natural. Okay, so, uh, so uh, after we include this one loop determinants and we again uh, integrate over the boundary mode uh, and the moduli, uh, so uh, uh, you get some answer. And so, uh, for example, uh, if we have one operator on each boundary, uh, then the answer that we computed is the following, is that uh, you can write the full answer as, a, as an expansion. So first, there's a term when you have only uh, one chord connecting the two boundary operators. Uh, and then there are similar uh, sort of uh, chord diagram rules that you, uh, uh, but which you now write on the uh, this double trumpet. Uh, you can you again you again assign some energies to these uh, regions on the Riemann surface, and you write the same kind of gamma functions. So the, these are this uh, this is essentially the same uh, uh, the same rules as on the disk. Now, the next term is when uh, we have an operator delta propagating on the closed geodesic. So here, so this comes from n equals one term in this determinant. So, so that's the delta operator delta propagating on the closed geodesic. And so uh, now what happens is that now you, you have this intersection of the closed geodesic and this horizontal geodesic. And because of that, now uh, you include a 6J symbol there. So that's something you, we derived from this uh, formula for the one of determinant. And so on. Actually, from the n equals two term, you have these double trace operators propagating. And so you have a corresponding uh, 6J symbol and so on, triple trace and so on. So that's the formula for the, uh, for the correlator on the double trunk. R is is there a UV divergence when the throat of the cylinder gets small? Uh, yes, certainly there is a UV divergence because of this uh, determinant. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I don't have too much to say about that. So uh, I, I, the way we match it essentially is that there is a UV divergence both in JT gravity and in the matrix model. Uh, and they kind of match. Uh, so on JT gravity, I don't have much to say about this divergence. Uh, on the matrix model side, uh, there is, uh, there, it seems like there's something interesting uh, that you can say there. 
uh, there it seems to be related to uh, uh, to the instability of the saddle, that, that there are some negative modes around the saddle that you expand around. Uh, yeah, so maybe after I can, it, uh, it will uh, probably take a little uh, longer than I want at the moment, but uh, maybe we can discuss this after. But in the basic model, there is something we can say about this, but uh, in the gravity side, not, not very much. So yeah, it's there and it's kind of just matched between matrix model and the GT gravity. Okay, thanks. Um, Bo? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the formula you wrote uh, does not involve the connected pair density correlator. Uh, sorry, I couldn't quite hear. Connected, connected what? The formula you wrote uh, does not involve, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a formula for the double trumpet. But I don't see anywhere the, you know, the, 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 the double trombet corresponds to the connected component of the two-point function of the density of state. And here I see a factorized uh, density of state. Uh, right, yes, there is, uh, yeah, there is no, uh, yeah, there's, unfortunately, there's no obvious connection between this formula and the double trumpet, yeah. If you you could have naively thought that uh, if you take, for example, delta going to zero in this formula, then you could have naively thought that you should reproduce the double trump in, in the pure JT gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is actually not quite true. Uh, and this is related to the fact that when you compute this, uh, this uh, correlator, you are uh, summing over geodesics that wind around as many times as you like. Uh, so you kind of have a straight geodesic, then you have a geodesic that winds once, twice, and so on. And so actually, if you take a delta going to zero limit, it will diverge because you're uh, in JT gravity, you sum over only like one rotation, sort of relative yeah. rotation, but here you sum over infinitely many rotations, relative rotations between two sides. So there's no, Obvious connections. Well, I, I, guess, I guess my my my. Uh, how should I? How can I see that the density of state of the disk is going to pop, pop out in the in this formula? Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, well, there is a computation that we did, and it pops out of there. So, uh, I I don't. Uh... Maybe I'm in the now. <laughs> ah. Just go on and maybe I will understand. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't have, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, you just have what comes out of the computation, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's a better way to say. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so in order to write down this formula, you used essentially some rules, right? And these rules were derived for this basic. No, so, can you repeat? I can't. I can't hear you. So in order, in order to derive this formula, you use some rules, right? The rules that you described, I don't know, two slides before or something. like uh, that. no, no, no. The, well, the these those rules is what we derived. Uh, there's a there's a computation in JT gravity that you can do. Roughly, well, I sketched it here. Uh, it sounds like you know you actually take the JT path integral. You use uh, the let's say boundary particle formalism if you're familiar with it. And then you do some chopping and gluing of the disk. You know, you have some, uh, uh, you chop uh, along these geodesics, you insert some e to the minus the geodesic lamp between the two operators, and then you integrate over the boundary modes and everything else. And then what you, and you also can include these determinants. And after uh, computing all the integrals, it happens that this formula pops out. And in this sense, we derive those uh, rules in this particular case. Does that? Uh, the claim is that this is the complete answer. There's nothing there is. Yeah, this is a complete answer. Well, you need to to do, you include this uh, infinite series over triple yeah, yeah. and so on, but uh, but in but yes, it's uh, it's an exact answer. Okay. The contribution from those triple and four trace operators and so on, 
is it like easy to write or it's like uh, the terms become more complicated as you go? Uh, no, 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 no. They're easy to write. So here, the only thing that says that it's double trace is this two delta plus two m. So there you take the same 6j symbol, you just write three delta plus whatever k or whatever, whatever the triple operator is, right? I see. It's, I see. It's it's the same 6j symbols, yeah. So hmm. here, uh, delta corresponds to this horizontal line because it's operator delta on the end of it. And uh, this top part is uh, whatever propagates on the, on the closed radius. Good, thanks. And I suppose there is no way of uh, doing some resumation in which this whole sum over trace operator becomes nicer in some way? We have not, uh, well, well, I guess we haven't really tried too hard, but uh, not that I know of, yes. Mm -hmm. I see. Thanks. But this expansion will actually be useful in the matrix model uh, uh, because uh, we will identify uh, a particular set of two diagrams in the matrix model, which rep would rep will reproduce these corresponding uh, these corresponding terms. So, in some sense, it's uh, yeah. It's I see. For, for that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, sorry. One last question, and then it's very fast. Uh, is is there a saddle uh, for each uh, member of this sum, or or these are purely uh, non uh, non classical uh, term? Uh, these are well. Uh, if you just keep uh, delta to be order one uh, in G Newton, then uh, there is no saddle, and it's just in the same way as in JT gravity. There is no saddle, but if you want a saddle, you in principle can take delta to be heavy. This will stabilize the wormhole, uh, and then you can then you can have a saddle. If delta is uh, sort of of order one over G Newton, then you might have a saddle. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, yeah, there's some computation you can do that you can do this uh, and get those 6J symbol in a, uh, uh, well, uh, we also considered some more complicated cases, but just, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, to sort of, uh, 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 to, to give you a gist of it or to convince you that, uh, uh, this should be more general that we considered uh, this uh, uh, pair of pants geometry and some contributions from the determinant there, which uh, uh, which give you these factors of uh, right where B is the length of that closed geodesic. Well, that they are after some integrations with the trumpet partition function, you actually get the 6J symbols. Uh, and so in this way, somehow uh, the 6J symbols know about the geodesic lengths on this, uh, on this, uh, on hyperbolic surfaces. And so uh, sort of a general prescription that we now sort of conjecture is that uh, the gravitational Feynman rules that I described on the disk, they generalize naturally to all higher topologies where uh, bulk lines or cords, if you like, they can either connect the uh, boundary points or you can have closed cords that correspond to the closed geodesics. And then once you draw these cords on a Riemann surface, you have the same sort of Feynman rules to write down the answer. And so this is a conjecture, uh, this, is, this is a natural conjecture at this point is that it should happen for an arbitrary Riemann surface. So this is sort of the summary of this uh, of these uh, computations. Yeah, if you did not follow anything, just the uh, upshot is that the chord diagram rules on the disk naturally generalize to hierarchies and more properties. Okay, so uh, I guess I have about uh, a third of my time uh, left. And so I have one third of my talk left as well, uh, unless there are any questions about, uh, about JT gravity.
Okay, now uh, then we move to the uh, two matrix model uh, and how, how we reproduce those correlators. So uh, to, to remind you, so we are interested in, in these observables. Uh, so we describe them in JT gravity uh, coupled to, to a free scalar. And now uh, we would like to compute it in a two matrix model of H and O. So now we propose that both the Hamiltonian and the matrix O are random uh, matrices. And they're simultaneously drawn from sum and sum. Uh, so so uh, some similar ensembles have been discussed in the literature. So, uh, well, recently, uh, Lynn Maldasana, Rosenberg, and Shan, uh, they discussed a similar ensemble in some supersymmetric models uh, at, at, in the states of zero energy. Uh, though, the, well, their ensemble was uh, just Gaussian for this matrix O. Uh, well, slightly different ensembles uh, have been discussed before by uh, uh, different groups. So, so in particular, uh, I'm not sure if any uh, of you are in the audience, but uh, the group at uh, UBC uh, also discussed uh, uh, an ensemble. So the difference between uh, these ensembles and what we discussed is that uh, uh, we also average, uh, well, both they and we uh, uh, average over uh, sort of, uh, so if you write them, uh, matrix O as some unitary times, uh, let's say some uh, eigenvalues, uh, uh, some diagonal mat matrix of uh, eigenvalues, let's say A1, AN, you dagger, uh, then, uh, so there's averaging over U uh, that's been done in these works and we also do that. But in addition, uh, we also average over the eigenvalues as well of, of, the, of this matrix. So that's, that's the difference. And at leading order, it seems that they give the same answers, uh, but, but uh, at subleading order in one of them, certainly they, they, they differ. Okay, so, uh, so to warm up, uh, let's recall uh, again how to topological recursion uh, works in the one matrix model that I briefly mentioned. Uh, already, but uh, just uh, uh, to say it again. Uh, so uh, if we are interested uh, in this multi-trace observables in a one matrix model, uh, so uh, the way you could do that is you uh, first, you fix the disk partition function in the matrix model and the disk density of states, which is this cinch. Then this uh, disk density of states, it determines the potential sort of in the standard way it's done in the matrix models through the uh, saddle, saddle equation for, for the uh, Coulomb gas. Uh, so, uh, and then once you fix the matrix model, uh, now to compute uh, uh, multi-trace observables or higher genus. Uh, so there are certain top, uh, recursion relations in, in the genus and the number of boundaries. And the disk, is the input of that recursion. So uh, what we would like to argue is that similar logic works in uh, the two matrix model case. So, so now uh, we uh, are interested in this kind of observables. Uh, so, uh, so what we would like to argue is that first you uh, take all the disk correlators uh, where you can uh, uh, have as many insertions of O as you like. Uh, and we argue that this, this correlator determine the two matrix potential. And the second step will be that higher topologies or more boundaries will be determined from this disk, from this disk correlators. So uh, it is uh, it is uh, natural to call it, it is sort of a, na a natural generalization of topological recursion. Well, I, I must say that the second step is not going to be nearly as streamlined as in arts recursion, but we will give some evidence in some simple examples that uh, that it, it seems to work. 
So systematically developing this multi-matrix topological recursion might be an interesting, might be an interesting. Okay, so let's uh, start with the point one then. So uh, how do we fix the, the potential, right? So we start with the potential. Uh, so, uh, well, uh, suppose we have some quartic potential, some general quartic potential. So here the matrix R is related to uh, the matrix O that we've been discussing so far uh, by just some rescaling uh, uh, by a rescaling by those gamma functions. It's just those gamma functions, they are kind of uh, appearing all over the place and it's more convenient to uh, rescale it away. So, but R is essentially O. Okay, so suppose now we have this quartic potential. And uh, so how do we relate it to the uh, disk correlators? Well, the way you do that, you write some kind of uh, shrinker Dyson equation. Uh, so so uh, a series of shrinker Dyson equations you can write are sort of uh, obtained from uh, these identities where you insert some number of Rs in your integral and you take a derivative. So essentially the first equation then you get is uh, this, and uh, this is, uh, and you can think of, think of it uh, as uh, an exact expression for the uh, two point function, uh, uh, which you expand in two diagrams due to these uh, interactions. And this is some kind of resummation of all the interaction terms. And similarly for uh, this case, but now you have some six point function here the, uh, and so on. So now uh, the uh, sort of non-trivial fact is that if you uh, take uh, JT answers for these disk correlators and you insert this, uh, the, the them uh, sort of, uh, uh, insert JT answers. So those like core diagrams and those expressions in these formulas, then these equations can actually be solved. And the solution is that these couplings are given by uh, these expressions. So these, uh, if you, yeah, th these might seem sort of complicated. Well, well, if you, well, I, I don't know if it's complicated or not, but there are some expressions in terms of 6J symbols. But uh, you can check that equations are satisfied, but the essential reason they are satisfied is that these objects, these 6J symbols are not some random, are not some arbitrary functions, but they obey some nice properties. So in particular, they uh, obey orthogonality relations that if you take some integral of like two 6J symbols uh, contracted in some, some way, so where the regions are like the energies, uh, then uh, there's some orthogonality relation. Uh, but, and also there's, it's important for satisfying this equation like an, uh, that uh, 6J symbols obey Young-Baxter equation as well. Uh, so some integrability properties of these 6J symbols are important here. Paolo, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I'm a little bit confused, but uh, I thought so, now you're analyzing these strong these these equations that you obtain for a uh, one matrix model. So I'm confused as to what happened with the usual H matrix that we have in in triple S. Oh uh, yes, yes, so it's a good question. Thank you. Uh, yes, I kind of swept it under the rug. But uh, so uh, what I assume is that so uh, first of all I work in the uh, uh, eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian. So here the sums are over the energies. And so what I imagine is that I do the uh, this integral over R first while keeping the matrix H fixed. And so the role of the matrix H uh, is essentially to induce the correct density of states. And so in all of these formulas at leading order uh, here, uh, what I really mean by the sums over energies, C and D, is integrals with the Schwarzschild density of states. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And so, for example, these equations for uh, for orthogonality of the six J symbol, it's also done with the uh, for the int where this integral over well where 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 all the integrals are done with the Schwartz and Dunster states. So, yeah. is there some assumption regarding the way the matrix H and the matrix O or R are coupled in the potential? Uh, yes, essentially, this is the coupling, right? This is also the coupling oh. between the matrix H and R because, so these guys are actually energies, right? So I just, uh, well, I wrote it in this S, but E is like S squared. So like EA, for example, would be SA squared. So all these entries are the energies. Uh, and so you are uh, integrating at the end of the day over uh, these energies, over these energy eigenvalues. I see, thanks. Okay, so uh, so the gist of this slide is that you can, uh, given that the disk correlators are given by JT formulas, you can fix the matrix potential uh, again through these uh, 6J symbols. And the reason that you can solve this uh, complicated looking Schringer Dyson equations is that the 6J symbols, they obey nice properties like orthogonality and young baxter equation. So this is sort of the, the summary of this stuff. And this, this is kind of the first step of the, this generalized topological recursion. Bob, can I ask like a tangent question here at this point? Yes, please. Uh, so so from, this, uh, from the JD computation, uh, starting from this correlation functions with the 6J representation, Six day simple representation. After analytically continuing, you can get the usual Lyapunov of behavior of OTOCs and so on. Now you have mapped this onto this matrix model potential. Is there a feature of this uh, ensemble of matrices that kind of can be linked to this chaos story? Yes, you are anticipating my uh, open questions slide. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, but that's indeed a very interesting question. Uh, yes, indeed, the 6J symbol, uh, it's uh, where the maximal Laponov exponent comes from. And so in the matrix model, uh, then you uh, can say that it comes from this quartic interaction. And so I think, yeah, it, uh, I haven't tried it in, uh, carefully, but I think, it, yeah, it might be interesting to try to identify maybe first uh, sort of some scaling regime, like you scale time to be of order scrambling time and so on. And th then maybe it means that you also need to approximate the 6J symbols by something simpler. So uh, one might hope that this, uh, Matrix model maybe simplifies in the uh, relevant limit. Yeah, maybe it gets some unstable huh? direction or something. And it's somehow, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. Just, I, I was just hoping for an intuitive picture of scrambling coming from that potential. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I don't have an intuitive picture. I, I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I'm uh, in particular, yeah, I think it might be interesting, for example, if there is a sort of general matrix model description of OTOCs, not necessarily maximal Lapunov exponent, but just sort of, if you have some Lapunov growth, then you have some uh, also ETH matrix model. And that kind of connects, right? That would connect different notions of, of chaos. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay, so, uh, uh, in the last few minutes, few minutes, uh, let me then try to uh, argue the second point. So the second, oh well, I, uh, this is I guess the question that uh, that that Mark asked uh, in the beginning. Uh, so this is in fact, yeah. So maybe since you since uh, you asked it before, so let me uh, say a few words here. So uh, in uh, uh, in uh, the uh, in JT gravity, there are some non-trivial correlators indeed. So uh, first, let's say we first consider the semi-classical limit. Uh, first, let's say we decouple gravity. Uh, then we just have a GFF uh, GFF operator O, 
And uh, this GFF uh, operator, it satisfies a non-trivial uh, identity that the correlator uh, of O of zero of T is proportional to identity. And so if you just randomly picked some finite size uh, matrix uh, matrices on N, so, and here H enters because I think of O of T as uh, in the standard way, as like O uh, in this way. I think of this O of T as, uh, uh, as containing the matrix H. And so if you just pick two finite size matrices on H, such an identity will never be satisfied. Uh, but it can be satisfied if we take a limit and go into infinity. So now, uh, now at finite G Newton, it actually turns out that uh, this identity, uh, after you dress these operators with the Schwarzian mode, this identity it, it is uplifted to something more complicated, which is which is this formula. And here, roughly, the role of six J symbol is that it exchanges two operators. Well, this is some kind of constraint that we need to impose on on our matrices. So if you write minus here. Right, uh, and uh, yeah, so if I uh, call my constraint to be, this is constraint equals to this difference, then the way I can impose it in the, in the matrix model is that I can take the potential to be the constraint squared times some large number, oh, let's say F. And uh, the funny thing that happens is that if you take this uh, potential and you compute it from this constraint, well, actually, you get this precise uh, this precise potential that we discussed. So in this in this way, this uh, identity is uh, is imposed. Uh, there are some subtleties with double scaling uh, that one might need to discuss. Uh, I'm technically out of time. Uh, uh, I have one, in principle, one important point to maybe briefly discuss, but I guess who is the organizer? Yeah. You're, you're good. I think you can go on for, uh, for however long you like. Oh, OK. Uh, well, a few minutes should be enough. I think, yeah. but thanks, yeah. Okay, so uh, so let's uh, discuss uh, the second point of the topological recursion, right? So so the second uh, step in the uh, topological recursion is that now higher genus or more boundaries uh, should be reproduced from the disk. So the example uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we discuss is uh, this sort of simple two boundary observable. So where you have one operator on each boundary and that genus zero. And so the question we ask, so how uh, do we compute this uh, quantity in the matrix model if we know the disk correlators? So uh, recall that in JT gravity, the answer for this object was uh, this formula, right, where we had uh, just no closed loops. We had operator delta propagating here and double traces propagating here and so on. And so uh, what we would like to do is we would like to obtain this formula in the matrix model from the disk correlators, equivalently this kind of objects. In the, in the energy basis, it's this kind of uh, a cyclic uh, product of, of matrix elements. Well, how do we do that? But well, let's start with the first term. So uh, how, how do we do that in the matrix model? Well, in the matrix model, what I should tell you is uh, what two diagrams you need to sum over in order to uh, get that answer. So uh, to get this uh, first term, uh, well, uh, the, it's kind of almost trivial. So the diagrams you sum are just, uh, let's say you first take uh, a, a contribution to just the two-point function, all, all planar uh, 
uh, uh, two diagrams contributing to the two-point function, right? But so far it will be, uh, right? Well, it's just, uh, it's, so far it's kind of like just a disk. But now if you want to get something with cylinder topology, what you do is, uh, so you have some energies here. So what you do is you just identify the top and the bottom parts of the diagrams and you integrate. So that you can imagine that this kind of connects on the other side of the cylinder. And now this is, topo this is uh, the topology is the cylinder. So what you do then is you just take the planar two point function, uh, which, you, which were these gamma functions and you impose uh, this delta function, which is identifying the top and bottom parts. And you do the standard integrals over the energies. And this is indeed precisely the uh, this thing that's, that appeared here. Well, this is almost trivial. Maybe uh, to, uh, you would, uh, uh, it would be clearer, uh, sort of what's the difference between cylinder uh, diagrams and the plane diag and disk diagrams is, is if we discuss the next case. So next we discuss uh, the contribution when we have an operator delta propagating on this closed geodesic. So now again, the logic is that we uh, start with some uh, disk correlator. So suppose we start first with uh, this uh, planar uh, four point function, okay? So, uh, and here, uh, so I've added th this fourth leg. So this is just a four point function. So we have an amputated connected contribution to the four point function, and like all two diagrams coming from that quartic interaction. And also we have these dressing, dressings of the legs, right? In the standard way, you need to also sum over dressings on the, on the legs of the diagrams. So if we uh, now dress all four legs here, then we would get just a planar or like disk uh, four point function, which would be given by the 6J symbol and this gamma and product of gamma functions. So this, this is the disk answer. Uh, but now what I want to do is I want to get a cylinder from this. Well, to get the cylinder, again, what I need to do is I need to identify the top and the bottom. And I also need to glue this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, propagator to, to to itself on the other side, so so that it's kind of a, again it's kind of connects on the other side and it's like a cylinder. But when I compute the uh, sort of dressing of this propagator that propagates on the back of the cylinder, I shouldn't overcount diagrams, and so I really need to dress that only once. And so uh, to get that, I need to remove here one of these, uh, one of these dressings, right? So this, uh, this extra dressing that we had, had uh, on the disk, I need to remove it. And so uh, here it's done uh, in, the, in a very simple way. So here I just divide by the corresponding gamma function, by the corresponding propagator, exact propagator. Okay, I'm not sure if I explained this very well. I think this is always the place where, where I think I'm maybe not doing the best job at explaining this, but uh, the essential idea is that you can get the uh, cylinder, the two diagrams that contribute on the cylinder by taking the disk, the exact disk correlator, and then doing some chopping of that correlator and, and then gluing. Okay, so, so we removed some propagator that's, uh, uh, that was, uh, that was here uh, on the disk, we need to re uh, we need to remove it to get something uh, on on the cylinder. So that that's kind of the idea. And this is kind of similar to the one matrix topological recursion in the sense that we also don't need to know the explicit form of the potential here, in fact, but we just used the uh, disk correlators directly to get the correlators on the cylinder. And similar computation can be done for higher windings. So, so we reproduced uh, like this first term, like this first term here. 
Now we can also discuss the uh, higher winding, like winding two, and it's more complicated. Again, it's some chopping and gluing of two diagrams. And actually this uh, winding two is uh, sort of quite subtle. And this is the reason we took us quite a while to figure this out. Here, it's not gonna be just simple uh, division by some functions. Now you need to apply some kind of uh, integral operator to this uh, two diagrams to remove like one part of this two diagrams. But uh, uh, the upshot is that it still uh, works and you reproduce this, uh, this 6J symbol with double traces. Is that is that a horn uh, that <laughs> it's time to end? Uh, it, it was not on top of it. <laughs> like yeah. like twins. Yeah. But then, uh, uh, yeah, essentially I'm done. Yeah, so uh, we also checked winding three, which is even more complicated, but uh, could be done. And so let me just. Uh, and here, so uh, let me just uh, quickly summarize if you uh, uh, missed most of the talk or it was uh, too fast or too boring or too slow. So the three main points are the following. So the point number one is that eigenstate normalization can be thought of as a, as a multi-matrix model. Point number two, uh, uh, the result number two is that the uh, gravitational Feynman rules uh, and these court slash geodesic diagrams, uh, they generalize uh, to a, an arbitrary Riemann surface. Uh, and point number three is, is that uh, there is some kind of multi matrix topological recursion. Uh, so these are three main points of my talk. And there are some open some open questions, and in particular, this one that uh, uh, Lampras mentioned is uh, indeed something I, I like uh, a lot and think might be might be interesting. Okay, thank you for for your attention, and sorry for going over time. Any questions? Um, well, I I do have a question about this last point. Uh, you, your model produces a, an answer for the other. And what is this answer? Uh, well, this answer is the same as in JT gravity. And this answer is this, uh, where is it? Uh, let me, let me see. So the in JT gravity coupled to a scalar, this talk is this 6J symbol part. It's this, uh, this thing. Okay. Is the effect of uh, higher genus contributions to this autoc, uh, are they interesting or do you expect them to be interesting in some sense or to dominate in some regime? Higher genus contributions. Uh, well, uh, well, not in, uh, at, yeah, not at, not at scrambling time, uh, I think. Uh, yeah, that at the at scrambling time, certainly it's, it's just suppressed. Uh, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. So at long times, maybe you can imagine that uh, something like that is important because well, at long times this autoc uh, just decays. So maybe at uh, very long times, you can imagine that genus one becomes dominant. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure. At, at long times, concerning the higher genus contributions to the OTOC, there was this paper about firewalls from, uh -huh. from Douglas and Genbin. Is is it possible to do a more exact version of their calculation using your matrix model? So uh, they compute a contribution to the odd talk from, from genus one, is that? Yeah, I think the, the disk with the handle. And as, as you say, it's late times that are relevant for that, uh, for uh -huh. that calculation. So uh -huh. if they find the contribution of like uh, T squared e to the minus S or something. So it's, it's exponential times where it becomes relevant. Mm -hmm, mm 
yeah that, that make that makes sense yes uh, yeah you, you're asking if uh sort of matrix model has anything to say about this or it's if it's simple yeah yeah exactly there or something or, or if you can do like uh an all genus version of their calculation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well yeah i pr probably wouldn't be able to do all genus but uh yeah i haven't thought about genus one well if, if you put it on a computer you can do an all genus <laughs> Oh yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's kind of in the double scale of lineage, right? So yeah. Might be hard to put on a computer. <laughs> yeah. Also, a question that I that I have about this is, so in theory, you know how to fix all the coefficients of these the two matrix uh, potential, right? But do you have some kind of recursion relation or that allows you to actually write them down? uh the matrix potential yeah well this is uh what we discussed here i guess so in in, in case of jt just coupled to a free scalar the potential is essentially this uh where the couplings are <coughs> functions of the of the energy but but don't you expect to have a higher order contributions that are not only r to the four but r to the six to the eight and and, and go on and so on Right, so uh, so uh, the uh, short answer is that is that here uh, uh, is just quartic, and it's roughly related to the fact that you in the core diagrams you have only kind of quartic intersections or interactions in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the subtlety is that uh, so this potential, right, and this. Uh, so these equations, as, as I wrote them here, uh, so uh, they are. Uh, so these equations are, uh, are true in the double scaling limit, All right? And in general, we expect the uh, uh, JT with matter as well to be dual to a matrix model in the double scaling limit. And so uh, what happens is that in the double scaling limit, these are the two most relevant terms. Uh, so so the, these are the only terms that survive. Uh, but in the, uh, in principle, if you uh, try to back away from the double scaling a little bit, and actually we uh, do uh, go away from the double scaling in some particular way. And in fact, in order uh, to make the computations finite, you need to do this. In the matrix model, uh, so uh, if you back away from the double scaling a little bit, then indeed there are these like higher order terms, as you say. I see, but but the statement is that if you were to be directly in the double scale limit, all you need to know is the quadratic and quartic term in this potential. Everything else doesn't matter. Yes. Okay. I'm so okay. And th those are enough to satisfy these Schringer Dyson equations, for example. Yeah, I thought these this, this equations that you're writing down for this kind of uh, simple case were, were like a toy model where you could do the computations and get the relevant contributions. I didn't appreciate the fact that this was actually getting everything for you in the double scaling limit. In the double scaling limit, yes, this is, this is all. But this uh -huh. is kind of, in JT gravity, this is related, I think, morally to this fact that when uh, so you have these uh, rules right chord chord diagram rules and uh, here you kind of only have quartic uh, intersections there's no like six point vertex or something yeah you only need the propagator and the the quartic yeah. interaction yeah yeah you know like let's say more general chaotic system uh, you probably have those uh, six and eight point interactions more expensive in the matrix model this is just a special case we're considering that I think um, thanks Bob, um, may, maybe you've commented on this but I may have missed it so in your in the double scale limit the the the, um, the leading order answer for the double two, for the two point function uh, when you when you have only one matrix is universal uh, it does not depend on the on the potential. Do, do you have something uh, similar for the multiple matrix case? 
Oh, uh, you also oh, you okay? You're asking about uh, the double trumpet, basically. For for example, yeah. Right? Yeah. that's uh, it's universal in the in one matrix models. It's uh, the one matrix. Uh, the uh, yeah, in one matrix models, the double trumpet is universal. But uh, yeah, in two matrix models, it's it's not uh, anymore universal because now it's uh, it it's, uh, really depends on your matter content and. Uh, so on. So it's uh, yeah. In particular, right in the matrix model, you don't reproduce the double trumpet from the disk. It's just uh, the second input of the topological recursion. Yeah, um, yeah. But in this case, we actually reproduce this uh, double trumpet with insertions of oh, we reproduce that from the disk mm. amplitudes, right? And disk amplitudes are not universal in the in the sense you mean. Right, so so yeah, here it's slightly different. Okay, thank you. In in the you didn't talk too much about this, but when you backed away from the double scaling limit and you put in the Q deformations, the, these Q deformation rules are most natural when you back away from the triple scale limit of SYK, right? Like that's that's where they come from, right? Yeah, yeah. In, in that discussion, there are no wormholes, right? And N is already infinite in, in SYK. And so E to the minus N effects are just zero. So do, do you expect that these Q deformation rules will will be the right ones on the higher topologies? Well, so uh, uh, well, there are two ways, I guess, to look at this. So uh, one uh, sort of uh, uh, way is which which we adopt basically is that you say, okay, so I have now some core diagram rules now including this Q deformation. Now I have the same uh, like core diagram rules, but now instead of the six J symbol, I have this Q deformed six J symbol. And I have this Q deformed density of states, and you just declare that's my kind of regularization of the model. That's uh, that's uh, the way I back away from the double scaling limits. And in the, in this way, we sort of forget about the, the fact that it came from double scale this YK. It's just some sort of way to back away from the double scaling limit where the matrix model is better defined. Mm -hmm. uh, well. Another way, I guess, uh, it, you you might, yeah, uh, it's it's also interesting, uh, maybe even more interesting physically, is to ask. So, but what actually happens in the double scale this YK? Uh, do you actually get some core diagram rules like this in double scale this YK or like in a YK in, in some way, right? Maybe that's what you are getting at more. Is that? Is not, that not quite. I, not I was quite? just. Yeah, I, I was just asking the, these Q deformation rules in in double scaled SYK. There are no when you write down these rules, you're just analyzing the disk in some sense, and all all the wormhole contributions are zero because n has been taken to infinity. So I was just wondering. It's I agree. It's like it's a perfectly consistent consistent way to generalize the matrix model that you wrote down yeah uh, to, to try to like back away from from the pure gravity limit in a in a consistent way but i'm just wondering if for example there's a sense in which these rules are like the the right ones even if you back away from the double scale limit of syk for instance ah okay uh Right. Uh, well, well, it, 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 you it, from the double scaling limit of SYK, you mean uh, a different double scaling limit, uh, like this limit. Uh, yeah, uh, exactly. Yes, yeah, so uh, double scaling limit. Is, uh, is, uh, is, yeah, yeah. You can you can ask, for example, whether if you fix if you uh, keep sort of the. Uh, uh, next order in like one over n time, times whatever functions of lambda, yeah, exactly. whether you would get the uh, uh, 
the uh, rules that I described, right? Yeah, well, e, e to the minus n times. Of yeah, yeah, oh, right, you're right, yeah, yeah. So here, I guess the, the, the contributions I'm discussing are really e to the minus n. So uh, yeah, these are different n, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. The minus yeah. n is like a, uh, right. Uh, yeah, that's an interesting question, whether you get those actually in SYK. Uh, I think the uh, one problem there is that, uh, so there's this paper by Berkus et al. that uh, says that there are actually, uh, be, even before these contributions, there are other contributions that are of order, that are much larger, that go something like one over n to the yeah. q, for example. Yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, so that's uh, right, so yeah, so there are much larger contributions, it seems. Uh, yeah. I don't know, yeah, it's, it's an interesting, interesting question. Maybe you can somehow separate out the interesting wormhole contributions there. Uh, yeah, in particular, because actually in this discussion, we have formulas for this q deformed double trumpet. Yeah. Uh, both with the uh, insertions, Of operators and without, I think yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, so it would be interesting to see uh, if there is a yeah, if if those are true in the in the SYK model, whether in some way we kind of derive this like in the bulk theory or in some proxy of the bulk theory, you might yeah, you might ask if on the boundary you can derive the same the same formulas. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? If not, let's thank Bara again.